Okay, we should be ready to go. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the regular meeting of the Revere School Committee. Uh, it is December 15th. Uh, please rise to salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America. America. and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, 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 liberty, liberty, liberty for justice for all. For all. We'll call the members. Mrs. Bronson Rizzo. Here. Mr. D'Ambrosio. Here. Mr. Ferranti. Here. Mrs. Gravelisi. Here. Mr. Sanella. Here. Ms. Ty. Here. Mayor Arrigo. Here. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ferranti. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion right now that we take some of the items out of order, where at this time we should uh, we have the AC Will in fourth grade presentation using new tools for remote learning. Second. Second, um, we'll motion to suspend the rules. All in favor, all opposed? Aye. 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 So, so moved. Uh, we will begin uh, tonight's meeting with the AC Whalen fourth grade presentation using new tools for remote learning. Dr. Kelly. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And we appreciate going out of order. Um, we have uh, Principal Phillips here with us now. Um, I am going to find the email he sent me that <laughs> shows me who the participants are um, and we'll start promoting them. And while I do that, um, Principal Phillips, if you wanted to, I made you a co-host, you should be able to share your screen if you wanted to start the presentation and um, I will stop bringing the teachers on. Okay, great. Are, are you able to, to hear me then? Okay, great. Yeah. So, thank you. Um, it's great to be back. It's nice to see everybody. Uh, tonight we have a little presentation actually from a few teachers and uh, some of our students. Um, and what we wanted to share with you tonight was a little bit about how we are trying to address the challenge of remote learning. Um, and so we actually have a, a kind of what I call snapshots of our school. Um, and we're gonna start actually with uh, two teachers. Uh, Valerie Sherman and Michael Siciliano, and they're going to talk about how they have addressed the challenge of taking a regular classroom, their regular classroom, and turning it into a virtual classroom. So I don't know if you had a chance to see this, but you'll get experience of what kids do, what their classroom looks like online. Uh, so they'll be our first uh, presenters. Uh, then we're going to have a little a presentation from a teacher, Jennifer Kingston, and she's going to talk about how she is trying to engage kids in sort of intrinsic motivation and provide choice uh, through her Genius Hour uh, presentation. You'll get to hear from some kids that are that, uh, presenting on their work. And then the last thing you're going to hear from our student council um, and how they are working to build community, even though we are in a remote setting. So let me, let me start and see if I can, um, I'm not an expert at this, so let me see if I can share my screen and get us to um, uh, Ms. Sherman and Mr. Siciliano. Um, I don't know, are they um, available? I'm here. To see? Okay, good. Yes, right. I'm here at well. Rumble. Okay, I great. I don't know why my video is not working, but I'm here. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna share my screen of your classroom and hopefully you can guide me through what you want to, um, uh, what you want me to point to as we go, okay? All right. All right. Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much for all of, all of you for uh, allowing us to present today. Uh, I'm Mike Siciliano. I'm one of the fourth grade teachers over at the Wayland School, uh, and myself and uh, Val Sherman, who is uh, a SPED teacher, we co-teach uh, one of the classrooms. So going into this year, you know, we knew this school year was going to be a school year unlike any other. And, you know, we all had concerns about the, the lack of social interaction that the students were going to have um, and, ang and anxiety about what the concept of school might look like. So, um, and I really want to give Valerie the, the credit on this because she's certainly more technologically savvy than I am. So <laughs> she was the one that actually put to this together what we call our Bitmoji classroom. Um, and what we wanted to do was recreate 
a, a physical space where that is very similar to our normal classroom where we actually have walls and, and drawers and uh, you know thing, places to display uh, resources. For us teachers, walls can be useful instruments for displaying graphic organizers, word walls, uh, other review materials that students can reference. Um, and so we tried to kind of recreate that in a fun way. Um, so as you'll see, we have different quote, quote unquote classrooms for our different, different content areas. So this would be kind of our homepage, but um, Principal Phillips, if you wouldn't mind cl clicking on the green button with the math uh, operations on it. So this is our, our math classroom. So as you can see, um, every day I post our lesson uh, objective. I post an agenda for us. Um, ooh, if you don't mind going back real quick, right. back button. There we go. Um, and we use this, you know, um, along with Google Classroom. Um, you know, Google Classroom is where we'll post our assignments and. We will post certain materials, but we have this here for the students. And one of the things we've found in using this, uh, it can lessen anxiety also as they know where to find certain resources. You know, in our classrooms, the students always know where to go to get certain things where as, you know, in this kind of remote learning environment, students might not know where to go to get certain things. So for example, uh, you know, right now we're doing two digit by two digit multiplication. But as you can see on one of the shelves there, we have a multiplication chart where students can go and students that may not have memorized their multiplication tables can click on that and, and, and get that resource for themselves that they can use uh, during this lesson. Uh, and we've done this for, like I said, for every content area. And we, kind of, we are constantly updating the different rooms with the, with the resource that may go with uh, that might align with our lesson at the time. Um, you know, one of the things we kind of learned as we went uh, was we were so excited about this that we kind of threw all the resources we could find and everything we thought was cool, we would throw on there. And I think we learned along the way that we may have been overpopulating uh, each page with materials and it, it became somewhat overwhelming for the students. Um, and the kids were light, less likely to use them when there was too many things on there. So we kind of had to simplify some of these classrooms, time to kind of take a less is more approach. Um, and rather than having all the resources we could find, just find those ones that align to the lessons we're using. So Principal Phillips, if you don't mind clicking back on the little home in the top, in the bottom right corner. And then right below our math symbol, you'll notice we have a little, uh, a science symbol, yeah, all the planets, and you can click on that. So again, this is our science classroom. Uh, Ms. Sherman's done a really nice job of finding resources such as posters that we might normally put on our walls. Um, and each of the items, icons on the shelf are all clickable tools that we use. Um, and one thing that we've also learned is in using Google Classroom, which is, which is great and important, but also it can be somewhat overwhelming for the kids with the different assignments and, and finding different things. So by putting little links in each classroom, it makes it much simpler for the kids to find a certain project that we've assigned or find that day's activities. Uh, and from here, I'll, I'll let uh, Valerie Sherman take over from there. So yes, please hit the home button again. So if you click on the poster on the wall, it says groups be great. So part of our practice, oops, sorry, hit the home button. Is it like up too high? Val, I'm going to take one second to, to just do a, a quick check in. Um, yes. the, the only people who should be in here are presenters and I'm not quite sure how others are arriving in the meeting itself. Um, so just to let people know, um, going to uh, remove people unless folks want to voluntarily uh, step out of the room? Um, yeah, just have to keep calm and carry on actually, Alex. Okay. So due to the fact that we are remote learning, we've had to make some adjustments 
in our practice. In general, we would normally have a calm down corner or a relaxation station in our classroom for students maybe a little overwhelmed at the time. So I tried to implement this in a fashion that students would have a lot of appropriate resources to explore that are some are educational, some are just fun, where they can relax and take their mind off. ABC, yeah, uh, ABC great resources for fun ways to learn education facts, story time story online, time online that have stories read aloud to them. So making things that work and are clickable and are fun, things like the penguin, is uh, the penguin of Chicago Zoo that they can just uh, watch the webcams and relax for a few minutes and take their mind off academics. So, um, and then, oh, um, and then we'll button again, please. And then uh, hit the academic intervention on the shelf. So we do create groups. We try to use post assessment and pre-assessments for every single unit and we try to adjust our groupings whether it's in our classroom or this is our intervention groups. I also have included on the bottom there are the links that the students generally will use during intervention or throughout the day for resources that they will need. Um, we try to update these frequently so that students um, are constantly like being reassessed and we can either create intervention activities or extension activities depending on what level the students are performing at that time. Again, these would be things that we would normally have posted on a chart in a classroom, but now they're accessible to the students with a schedule so that they know where they go every single day for intervention. Um, so, and then you can just hit the home button again and actually I'm going to cut off right there. And I hope that you guys have enjoyed this. We try to keep it as consistent as possible. And we are trying to just incorporate as many things like an art wall. We're trying to make sure that the students understand the Zoom rules. And of course they get to see my awesome dog, Daisy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Siciliano. And, and thank you, Ms. Sherman. Thank Great. you for having us. Okay. And then I am, let me just click over and see if we can get to, um, Ms. Kingston, are you, are you here? I am, but if you wanna have uh, Lenore go first so that the okay. kids can log off. All right, that's, that's probably a good need. idea. All right, so let's go to the, the student council. All right. Okay, um, so I just wanna make sure that Valentina and Sharon are both here. They are the presenters tonight. So if I'm Valentina, here. And is Sharon here? Yeah. Sharon's not in yet. I think she said she was. <laughs> so everybody should be on mute, student council, except for Valentina and Sharon, okay? I just promoted Sharon, Mr. Legro. She should Thank be in. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. So... First of all, the AC Wayland Student Council would like to thank the school committee for inviting us here tonight to present. The students on the Student Council, as well as all the students at the Wayland School, have done a phenomenal job during remote learning. They impress us every day with their enthusiasm, their ideas, their work ethic, and their resilience. So Student Council has been working on a few projects and they're glad to be sharing tonight what they're doing with you. So not to waste any more time, I would like to introduce to you Valentina Cataldo, the president of the AC Wayland Student Council, to tell you what we've been working on. Um, Mr. Phillips, could you change the slide? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Here we go. My name is Valentina Cataldo and I am president of the AC Wayland Student Council. When school started this year, I wasn't sure we were even having a student council. I was so happy when I found out we were having student council because I was a part of it since third grade. I really like being on student council because we plan events for students to have more fun on Zoom. Things like dress up days, movie days, and fun holiday theme days. Please change the slide. Just like everything else this year, the student council election looked different. We had to turn in our nomination papers through Google Forms and the voting was all done virtually. The good thing about this is the votes were counted really quickly. Please change the slide. Once the council members were elected, we set up a meeting calendar to meet virtually every month. When we 
we when we meet, we talk about ways that we could get all of the students in the school involved in fun activities. So we feel a part of the Wayland School family. We also think about ways to help others in our community who might need a little extra help, especially now during the pandemic. I want to introduce the Vice President of Student Council, Sharon Oliva Fogar, to tell you a little about how we helped this community this year. Please change the slide. Thank you, Valentina, and thank you, School Committee, for inviting us here tonight. The holiday food drive was one of the first activities the Student Council and community. community is a big part of the Student Council. The, we try to help others who are less efficient and just in the school and our city a better place. This year, we knew there are people and don't always have enough to eat. So we organized a way to collect to donate to the Revere Food Pantry, which changed the slide. Our teachers put a box and table in front of the school. We want to thank Ms. Hurley for keeping an eye on the donations during the days. We collected student Students drop off canned goods, boxed food, and lots of nice snacks to donate. They stayed socially distanced and wore their masks. When we came to school, when they came to school, the student council is very happy that we got so much food and were able to help the people living in our own city. We hope this is just the beginning of the year full of fundraising to help others and fun days to build up our school. Community. Please change this. We are currently working on two projects. The first is an ugly sweater day. This is a day where everyone wears an ugly sweater and uploads a picture. It's fun to see all of the friends we don't see every day anymore. The second project is a letter writing campaign for the elderly. We are helping elder services of Revere by making cards for older people who have been away from their families during the pandemic. We'll be collecting cards all this week and hope it will brighten their days a little. Thank you again for giving us the opportunity to show you a little of what the AC Wayland Student Council has been doing. Keep watching. Okay. Thank, thank you, Student Council, for sharing what's been going on at the Wayland School. And then to, to finish it up, we are going to ask uh, Ms. Kingston just to talk a little bit about uh, Genius Hour. Okay, so uh, Genius Hour happens uh, for the fourth grade students who are in my intervention. Some of them, past students, are in here uh, in the meeting right now. And they basically conduct a research project where of a topic of their choice. It's to include both their speaking, improve their speaking skills, improve their research skills for nonfiction text, and to help them increase their interest in a certain subject. So this is two, a video of two students presenting their uh, research projects. One is about space and the other is about dinosaurs. Okay, thank you, let's begin. If you hit play, it should work. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Ariana Stillman and I have made this presentation about space and astronauts. I hope you like it. To start off, we have eight planets in our solar system. They are Earth, Jupiter, Venus, Saturn, Mars, Neptune, Uranus, Mercury, and Pluto. Fun facts. Jupiter is the oldest planet in the solar system, and Saturn is the only planet in our solar system that is less dense than water. If you made a bathtub big enough, the planet would float. All about astronauts. Yuri Gagarin was the first human to be in space. And second, on June 18, 1983, NASA astronaut Sally K. Ride was the first woman in space. All about planets. 
If you step onto the moon, the footprints will be there for over 100 million years. The moon has no atmosphere, which means there is no wind to erode the surface, and also no water to wash the footprints away. Earth is the only planet that has liquid water. It does rain on other planets, but there is no liquid water coming out of the clouds. Instead, for an example, it rains acid on Venus. Ooh. You know, did you know a full NASA spacesuit would cost $12 million? 70% of that cost is only for the backpack and control module. That's a lot considering that for the whole suit, 70% out of the 12 million is only used for two things. Because it's that much money, it's one of the most important parts of the whole suit. Yuri Gagarin. Yuri was an astronaut for the Soviet Air Force. And here are some facts about him. April 12th, 1961, Yuri orbited Earth on a spacecraft called Vostok 1. His first flight lasted 108 minutes, and sadly, he died on March 27th, 1968. And that's it. Thanks for reading, and I hope you liked it. <laughs> A prehistoric project by me. The Compsognathus. The Compsognathus is a tiny dinosaur, but it's still dangerous dangerous because it is a carnivore. The Compsognathus lived in the Jurassic period and tried to eat anything itself. Although sometimes the other dinosaurs would have the upper hand because how small the Compsognathus was. The Tyrannosaurus rex, carnivore. The Tyrannosaurus rex is one of the most well-known dinosaurs of all time. The dinosaur's name means tyrant lizard as it wiped out anything and everything. A T-Rex lived in Western North America. The Brachiosaurus, I heard before. The Brachiosaurus was one of the tallest and biggest dinosaurs, plant, the biggest plant-eating dinosaur to run the... T-Rex in the fight to the death. The Spinosaurus normally ate fish and meat because it was a carnivore. The Spinosaurus also has something that other dinosaurs don't have, which is a sail on its back because it needed to play, because it also swam. The Velociraptor. The Velociraptor is a carnivorous dinosaur which lived in the Cretaceous period about 75 million years ago. This species was the first, was, this species of dinosaur was the first discovered by Peter Kaysen in the Gobi Desert of, on August 11th, 1923. A year later, it was given the name Velociraptor. This name combines the Latin word velox, which means swift in, which means swift in Latin word robber, which means rob. The Mosasaurus, the carnivore. The Mosasaurus was just a killer whale, but the killer is more serious than just eating fish because the Mosasaur ate turtles, mollusks, shellfish. The Mosasaur had teeth that could break through the shells of turtles. Zorgas, Titanoboa, oh, carnivore. Titanoboa was a giant snake that lived in the in La. Gujira, and northeastern Colombia. The Titanoboa was 50 feet long and weighed 2,500 pounds. For example, a truck is around 50 feet long, which means that the Titanoboa will be the same length as that truck. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all to, to our presenters. Um, and for the school committee, we appreciate this opportunity to share what's going on at the Wayland School. Um, I hope you got some sense of a snapshot of some of the things and, and how we are adapting to remote learning. Uh, we're very grateful for your time and this opportunity to present and to our presenters uh, for presenting. So thank you all and, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. There may be thank some there may, I don't know if there might be some questions from the committee if you folks oh, can sure. hold on for just another minute. Do, do any members have any questions? Just an observation. It, it's something, there is something fascinating about dinosaurs. <laughs> and no matter what they are, 
no matter how, how many times you look at them, they're still just as interesting the next time you look at them. So thank you so much. I like your fun facts too. Yeah, Bia did a great job. He actually is now inspired to make a website and he's making an entire encyclopedia for everything that he learns about the dinosaurs. And oh. the other presenter is here now and it was Ariana Stillman. Uh-huh. She did the space presentation. So I'm very proud of her. Yeah. Yeah. They're great kids. Congratulations yeah. to you. And I'll ask if any of the uh, committee members recognized um, that Ariana's presentation talked about the eight planets in our solar system. Um, Ariana, I don't know if you know this, but when we were all growing up, there were nine. <laughs> right. <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> I asked her to include Pluto as a nod to the 90s baby. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I did it for her. <laughs> nice job. <laughs> any other members have any comments? None. Thank you so much for the great work. Thank you. Great job. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. So we'll move on to the uh, are we moving on to the George V. Kalala Academic Achievement Awards? Uh, we're actually the um, MASS certificate. Oh, the MASS. Yeah. First. Okay, my, my fault. Um, we're going to move to the MASS uh, Certificates of Academic Excellence. And I'm just going to go to um, attendees and, and bring our two students up. Um, <laughs> okay so um i always uh enjoy giving these awards um these awards are uh presented to two high school students we always do them in the fall so that they can include them on their resumes for a college uh for their college application process um, and each year, the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents um, invites us to identify uh, one or two, in this, in this case, two students, um, who have done unbelievable work, excelled academically, overcome tremendous odds in some cases, um, and just all around incredible people who uh, we want to give a special uh, kind of recognition to for all of their hard work and all of their achievements. Um, and this year, uh, it, I'll just read the certificate first. It says a certificate of ac academic excellence, having duly qualified under the standards prescribed by the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents is hereby awarded this certificate of academic excellence uh, in witness hereof the sale of the association and the signature of the superintendent of schools. And this year, I'm incredibly proud um, to award these certificates to Ivan Garcia Zapata, show you his. And Ivan, we're going to mail this to you. Um, and the second award is for Sydney Ciano. Ah. My camera. And so I'm going to invite um, Ivan and then uh, Sydney to tell us a little bit about what your plans are and why you think we, I selected you guys for this award. So Ivan, you can go first. We'll put you in the pressure spot while Sydney thinks about what she wants to say. <laughs> All right, so, oh, th thank you so much for this. I'm really honored to receive this award. Uh, I, I'm actually planning on going to college, so four year, I'm, I still don't know where. Uh, it's still a little bit early with all the acceptance and all that stuff. But yeah, my plan is to study economics and psychology. And yeah, that's, that's how far I've planned so far. <laughs> What's your first choice, Ivan, of school? Oh, I'm thinking Harvard, um, but we'll we'll see we'll see how it turns out. If not, there's a, there's a lot of other options around here. Where else did you apply to? I applied to UMass Amherst, uh, UMass Boston, Brown, Boston College, mm -hmm. and and I still have more to apply to, but those are the ones that I've sent so far. <laughs> and I did get into UMass Amherst, so that's that's really nice. That's great! Congratulations! <laughs> Thank you so much. 
And the other question was, why do you, why do I think I received this award, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not, to be honest, I'm really, I'm really grateful, but I'm not, I'm not too sure. I mean, I don't know if I've done more than the other students around me because I try to just be with them all the time, but I've been doing some work with the robotics team and with the robotics team, I do try to do some volunteering. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that right now I have over 150 community service hours. Mm -hmm. um, oh. and I've, <laughs> thank you. I've done that mostly with robotics, either helping out students that don't know, don't really know English because I am, I was an ELL student before. So because of that, I do try to help, um, I do try to help students that are into, that are in the, that were in the same, uh, in the same um, shoes as me. So I did end up volunteering uh, at a summer camp that the, that the high school run, but it was for the middle school students. I did, I did um, over 50 hours there uh, helping them out. And I've also been helping out students through a mentoring program, uh, middle school students through a mentoring program that we created virtually just because of the, the whole quarantine and all that. So um, wow. we noticed that there was a need to, to help some students. So we did that and we're hoping to expand to all the middle schools. But as of right now, we're only doing SBA. <laughs> and I guess- Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm gonna fill in the gaps that Ivan left out <laughs> um, I don't think that you mentioned the Cyber Seniors Mentoring Program that you're part of. Do you want to talk about that? Of course, of course. So during the during the summer, during the summer, we we weren't able to be in an actual internship with MGH, but through the MGH program that I am into, is the MGH Youth Scholars. I had the chance to um, work with some seniors, some seniors as in uh, elders. And I help them just learn more about computers and learn more about how to use their phones and all that. It was really fun to just help them out and for them to just be so um, amazed at all the things that they could do with their devices. I managed to help one of them get into Zoom. Like they, they had never used them before. So I, I managed to call them and then through that, I helped him get into Zoom and then hopefully he can call his family. I also helped another senior that felt a little bit um, sad staying inside. I helped them use the Google Maps. Um, it's, I believe it's called Street View. And I helped them kind of move around other cities. So, so they told me that they wanted to see London. And uh, I went to London and I, I taught them how to be able to just walk around the streets the street of London and New Zealand. Uh. It was fun. <laughs> and can, can you tell us a little bit about the Department of State's Youth uh, Ambassador Program that you're part of? Of course. So that was another thing that I did this summer. Uh, I was actually supposed to go to Argentina and Chile this summer, but the quarantine got us. So, <laughs> so I wasn't able to go, but um, I was lucky that the program became virtual. And because of that, I was able to, it was uh, kind of a leadership workshop, but through all that, I ended up um, meeting some amazing people from all over the U.S. and from Argentina and Chile. And I actually, yesterday, I was in a Zoom call with them. We, we tried to have weekly Zoom calls um, with the people from Argentina. And I was, I was talking to them. I still talk to them. They're really, we have a group chat on WhatsApp. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. So those are some of the great reasons that um, we selected Ivan for this award. And we're just really proud of you and uh, proud of your accomplishments, proud of everything you do for uh, the people around you. Um, whether they're friends or seniors or younger kids or whatever the case may be. Um, and we just hope that you're going to remember us when you graduate from Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. I really okay. appreciate this. Great. So Sydney, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, why you think that you were selected for this award and, and what your plans are? Oh, we cannot hear you for some reason. Um, there you go. Okay. Um, so my plan is to go to a four-year college. Um, Stanford's my top choice right now. I'm doing all regular decisions, so I'm getting all those apps in. Um, and as for what I want to do, I want to major in creative writing or go for English if that's if they don't have creative writing. Um, I also want to minor in dance if that's available. As for why I think I got 
the award. Um, first, like, thank you for the award. I'm very grateful for it. Um, I mainly academic studies, and I've also participated in sports and clubs at my school. I was on, on the volleyball team, and I am the Poetry Out Loud leader for the past three years, and I've been in the club for four years. So I think those are the main reasons. Yeah, and, and again, we have another humble student. So um, by the Poetry Out Loud leader, Sydney means that she's been our Poet Laureate, right? right. Yeah. Uh, and I know that Miss Ty will appreciate that you use uh, that title. Um, she's been a tutor to her peers in our writing center. Do you want to talk a little bit about that work? Um, so I started junior year. I have done a semester of being a writing center tutor. Um, so I've helped students of all different levels of all different grades with writing assignments, um, organizing their writing um, and just mentoring them through, the, through their writing process. And I plan on doing two periods of Writing Center this year in the spring over um, Zoom. That's great. And um, writing seems to be a bit of your forte because you also have a job working. Well, you have the job at Bianchi's, but you have another job. What's your other job? Um, over the summer, I was also, I also had an internship at the Revere Journal. I was um, writing articles. I wrote three over the summer. That's great. So um, I think that the committee can understand why these two phenomenal uh, young people were selected for these awards. And Sydney, like I said to Ivan, I hope that you'll remember us when you come back from Stanford. I don't know if any of the committee members have other questions they'd like to ask. Uh, Mrs. Rizzo? I just want to say thank you both. Uh, it, it just makes us see we have wonderful students in this system, and you two represent all that is great in our city. Um, Ivan and Sydney, or should I say seven, um, your mentoring programs are, are so... I can't even think of a word for it. I, I'm just amazed at how much work you both do and just so proud um, to see you now and can't wait to see what you're going to do in the future. So thank you both for making um, all of us at the Revere School Committee and the Revere Public, Di Public School District so proud. Thank you both. Thank you, Mrs. Rizzo. Any other members? Me. Ms. Ty. Ms. Ty. <laughs> I think I remember, Sydney, uh, from the Poetry Out Loud contest. And it seems to me that she also won writing awards over the course of the years. And I think she also won a Kaloa Academic Award. Um, and Ivan, uh, you have been a scholar all the way along. I know the people at MGH at Revere Cares are particularly proud of you and all of the colleagues who work so hard with you. So we are, or I look at you, uh, the two of you, and so many of your um, wonderful kids that are with you know that there's a lot of competition. So for the two of you to be selected, I think it's a phenomenal achievement. And uh, thank you. You make us all Revere proud. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, any other members? Okay, seeing none. Uh, congratulations, Sydney. Congratulations, Ivan. Uh, one note, Ivan, when you are done at Harvard, you can come back and give some of us a Zoom lesson. I think uh, <laughs> some of the committee members might appreciate that. So Yes. <laughs> I'll tell you, I love the idea of visiting another city by going on um, Google Maps. I hadn't thought of that. Google Earth. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think we can all agree, I probably could use Sydney's assistance in um, English. <laughs> I think that we could all use that. Maybe not Carol, but the rest of us for sure. Uh, true. We want to check for Carol for sure. Well, mm -hmm. uh, listen, <laughs> no one's perfect. <laughs> Sydney, we're going to have to think about how we figure out a poem in your pocket day this year. Oh, yes. Oh, we've lost your audio again.
not coming back, I don't think. All right. Well, we'll chat about that offline, Sydney. Thank you guys both very much. Don't feel like you need to the rest. Congratulations. Yes. Congratulations. Okay. Okay, so we'll move on to the George V. Colella Academic Achievement Awards. Yeah, first, um, I have a question first, uh, sure. Dr. Ms. Kelly. Uh, are these kids going to be um, joining our meeting to resume? Um, I believe that they are not. I don't think that we um, sent invitations. That we weren't able to do that. Uh, yes. Um, they had, um, let me just check. <clears throat> No, they're, uh, I believe they're not here. Okay. Um, well, the, I'll just talk a little bit about what the Kalala Awards are. Uh, the Kalala Awards are part of the legacy of uh, George V. Kalala, who served the city of Revere, first on the school committee, then on the city council, then as mayor, and then back as city council. But as mayor, he was one of the longest serving in the entire Commonwealth. He was a Revere, a Revere Public Schools kid and... Um, all the time. He went to Revere High School. He graduated in 1945, a long time ago, married his high school sweetheart. Uh, they had three kids, uh, three girls, all of whom went to Revere High School, all of whom were wonderful writers, by the way, and I was lucky to have been their teacher. Um, but so above all, he was concerned about education. You know, even when we had the most difficult times, Mr. Sedella will remember this, there was a joke that always went around the city that George Colella had a bottom draw. Now, I'm not sure, uh, Mr. Mayor, whether you found that bottom draw when you went up to City Hall or not, because there might still be a little bit money in there because George always had money in the bottom draw. And more often than not, when we were in desperation for something, we'd go and say, uh, do you think you can find something for us? Eddie always found something for the kids. Um, as you know, that some of you know, that he has his name on a plaque outside of City Hall. But he did know that the best memorial that you can have is make a good difference in people's lives. And so he instructed uh, a change uh, in policies. He instructed people to change the way they did things uh, so that it would be easier for people. He built schools and he always looked to the future. Well, looking to the future, he thought, well, there are a lot of kids who get scholarships from Riviera High School when they go on to college, but what about the kids at younger age, just to give them something and um, uh, not only an award, but a financial award too. And so he set up an account so that the number one student in all of the elementary and all of the um, middle schools would get a check for $200 and a certificate of uh, merit from the Re uh, Revere City Council. And so we did that last week. Uh, when he passed away in 2010, when they opened his will and they started giving these in 2011, there have been so far 90 awards given to the tune of $18,000 that Mayor Kalawa had left in his will to be given to these students. He originally thought that it should be the highest student there, but um, at rethinking, he decided that no, it, it should be partly a citizenship too. So, he, and he knew how difficult it was uh, to be both, to live a full life and to be caring for the others while you were achieving for yourself. We had two of these kids who won them in the fifth grade, Kendall Giordano and Safala Rusi. Um, and some of them come from families who have won in the past too. But they are all just scholars, good kids, interested in other people, and again, make us Revere proud. So congratulations out there. I hope you're watching either live or at some point in a rebroadcast. Congratulations to all of the winners. Um, they are from the Beachmont School, Samyak Maharjan. From the Garfield Elementary, Justin Cavalcanti. From the Hill School, Akraf Bukiru. From the Lincoln School, Amy Pineda Mejia. From the Paul Revere, Lena Lee. 
from the Whalen, Nyla Vranek, from the Garfield Middle, Kendall Giordano, who had also won uh, in the elementary school, from the Rumney Marsh, Safa LaRussi, who's, uh, who also won through the elementary school, and from the Susan B. Anthony, Glenn Cool. Their awards were given at the city council meeting, and I have their certificate of merits to pass on to them. Uh, and at this time, I would like to make a motion that the Revere School Committee honor the winners of the Colella Awards with a certificate of excellence um, in both academics and citizenship. Second. Second. Uh, we'll take a roll call. Mrs. Bronson Rizzo? Yes. Mr. D'Ambrosio? Yes. Mr. Ferranti? Yes. Mrs. Gravelisi? Yes. Mr. Sanella? Yes. Ms. Ty? Yes. Mayor Rigo? Yes. Motion passes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ty, for um, for that information, and I haven't uh, yet found that that special drawer uh, that that Mayor Carla <laughs> had. But I try to do my best with uh, with Dr. Kelly, and we try to we try to do our best for the for the students of the of the, uh, of the district and for the families. So uh, that you maybe, have not only need, tried but accomplished. I, I think after twenty you. after twenty years, you might find the map to that to that <laughs> secret drawer somewhere in, in this office. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations to everyone. Congratulations, that's right. Um, I believe we'll now go back to the regular order of business um, and we will move to um, open it up to public speak. Dr. Kelly, uh, do you have the, the controls on who's got their hand raised and who we can I promote? I do, give me just a minute. Sure. Um, we we have one hand up. Uh, it's Mr. DeChico. Um, and Ralph, if if you could just uh, unmute. And Brian, what is the rule name and address? Name and address for the record, and uh, just a reminder uh, that we're limiting things to three minutes. Friendly reminder. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. I apologize. I am uh, in the middle of trying to finish up the food pantry. Um, I just wanted to um, ask a, uh, a comment to the school committee um, in regards to um, kids with special needs. Um, I know that there's been work on trying to get these children back into the school. Um, unfortunately, um, I was unable to attend the meeting on last Thursday. Uh, there were some great comments by some people, but I just wanted to ask a question and a suggestion uh, of trying to uh, facilitate some in-home one-on-one tutoring for these students. Uh, my suggestion is I know that there was transportation money that I know we had, there was contract money and it was, there was renegotiations with those contracts and some money did come back to the schools. And I know because of net spending, if that money is not reallocated in another line item, it's gonna have to go back. So I wanted to see if possibly we could be able to uh, see about getting some services for one-on-one -on -one in home for these students. And also another question that I have is, I know that the, the school department has been contracted in the past with some social services uh, agencies. So I'm not sure if that's also another thing that there was renegotiations for money coming back and these, uh, these social services, uh, if they're still under contract and they're not coming to the schools, if we could also see about getting them to come to the homes for, for these for these families, um, because they, they do need them at the home. Um, and I do know that there are agencies that will go one on one to the homes because I have been working on it with the Commission of Disabilities. Just in case I didn't say my name and uh, address for the record, it's Ralph Chico, 49 Washington Street, Revere, and I'm also uh, the chair of the Revere Commission on Disabilities. Thank you, Ralph. I don't see any other hands up, Mr. Mayor. Okay. We'll move on to 
the regular order of business and we'll bring up the wellness committee report. Well, the superintendent's report. So Dr. Kelly, please uh, take it away. Thank you. And uh, the next item is uh, the wellness update, um, which uh, I know that Dr. Gallucci and uh, Mr. Shea are going to um, present together. I know they have a num number of items to speak on. Um, included in them will be an update on athletics, um, but they're also going to talk about the work that the wellness committee uh, has been engaged in. And I'm sure that Mrs. Rizzo, who also sits on the committee, will have some uh, information to contribute. Um, and they're going to talk about um, some of the work we're doing with the uh, Sandy Hook Promise program, which is also part of our wellness initiative. So with that, I will give it to Dr. Gallucci and um, Mr. Shea. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. I'm gonna share my screen. All right. So this is our uh, wellness committee update. Um, we're gonna talk about some of the things that we focused on early in the school year. Um, and we're going to start with kind of the overall health and safety of our entire school community. And uh, this year is obviously very different than any of the previous. It's uncharted waters for a number of reasons. Uh, but one area that we focused on um, a great deal in our first few meetings uh, has been the health and safety and uh, the air quality work that Carl Svensson and his team have been doing. Uh, I can't say enough about Carl and his expertise, his innovation, um, his transparency, and his dedication to ensuring that all buildings were um, safe and um, comfortable for all uh, of, our, of its occupants. Uh, so we had established this focus on health and safety. Um, it specifically focused on HVAC <laughs> systems, which obviously became an area of focus for our district community. Um, Carl has attended all of our wellness meetings. He is a wellness committee member. Um, we've discussed air quality test results that have been conducted as far back as the summer uh, and into the early fall. Um, Carl has led all of these conversations. Uh, he's made presentations at each of our wellness committee meetings. He has fielded questions from any and all uh, participants in the wellness committee. Um, and I'm happy to report uh, that we, after conducting three rounds of testing, um, we have ensured that our buildings have met the set, set forth ASHRAE standards, that our systems are functioning to full capacity. Um, in our latest report, Carl was able to communicate extremely positive results um, that indicated that teachers uh, can feel comfortable to have their windows closed as the temperatures have dropped um, and we're no longer reliant on windows open uh, as a means of ensuring air purification. Um, so that has been kind of one piece of our wellness work, but I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Shea to kind of outline um, some of the other areas we've focused on. Thank you, Dr. Gallucci. Sorry, Frank, before you go on, um, Dr. Gallucci, if I could just say, mm -hmm. we are awaiting um, the air purifiers for the high school. It's the one place where we have um, work to do. And those are due to come in in January? Technically later this month, hopefully, but yeah. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Gallucci, and welcome everyone. And thank you for having me tonight. Um, I'm going to speak on, uh, there's a couple of big rocks that we're trying to uh, get to this year. And, and the first one uh, is our wellness committee <clears throat> uh, policy review. And uh, this was set to be done last year in the spring. Uh, however, when COVID uh, struck us, uh, the state granted us uh, some leniency and uh, allowed us to uh, take on that work uh, this year. So we've just begun starting to review our wellness policy, which is a 12 page document. Um, it is revised once every three years. Uh, and it just consists of the committee members review the current policy and we propose any changes to either personnel on the committee or to some of the policies that are associated with wellness, nutrition, physical activity and, 
anything else that promotes student wellness in the district. Um, so we just started meeting at the last meeting. We'll continue this work um, with some chunks of time going forward. Um, as we get towards the springtime, any revisions or omissions to the policy um, will be presented to the entire committee. And any changes will uh, be put into a policy draft and presented to the superintendent's office and then to the school committee. Uh, when these revisions are accepted and updated, uh, they'll be shared on our district website and they will promote our work going forward into next year. Um, all our members, uh, this, is, this is actually uh, another big rock. It's our subcommittee work. And I have to really give credit for the forming of these subcommittees to Ms. Rizzo. This was something that, again, she proposed last year and probably uh, in the winter months. And we had just begun to start working in subcommittees when, again, we got struck by COVID. Um, so Ms. Rizzo did uh, ask that we continue this work, which is very important to our committee going forward. And um, all our members serve on one of the four subcommittees. Um, these committees, again, we chunk uh, a bit of time in each monthly meeting to discuss uh, things that are offered throughout the city, what we can add, what we can strengthen, what we need to change, uh, obviously, um, as we go forward and, and as COVID struck and we've come across some different areas of concern in the city and, and areas where we think we can make a change. Um, these subcommittees share out information to the entire committee. And again, those changes uh, will go to the overall, into the overall policy if, if applicable. Um, the subcommittees and the topics can change on any given year, depending on the needs of the community uh, and as the committee sees fit. Next slide, please. Um, so the four areas we identified last year um, were nutrition, mental health, physical activity, and substance abuse. And we, we first ask each committee member which subcommittee they feel comfortable joining. And then we go out and we try to pick some people who have expertise in those fields and add them to the committees if they have not already joined. So the next slide will show uh, just the list of subcommittee members. Um, those are our committee members this year going forward. And again, starting in our next meeting, we'll start to do some of that important work. And if we can go to the next slide. Um, so that's basically the work of our wellness committee. So before I go on to athletics, I think we should, if there's any questions, to be the me or Dr. Gallucci or Ms. Rizzo. Any members have any questions? Frank, I just have a comment. Uh, the mayor, I have a comment. Um, and, and I just need to say when Frank came on board, he really, um, him along with Dr. Vidala, really formed this committee so that it was doing um, work, not just in words, but actually doing some work. Um, I also want to thank Cheryl, um, Cheryl Cole from Aramark, who really put our wellness policy together at the beginning so that we have something to go by so we can update it much more easily. And to the members that have been coming for almost eight years, consistently coming, um, you know, the work that they've all done is really getting us to a great place for our students in the community. Um, also, I thought it was a great idea that Dr. Gallucci and um, Frank Shea decided to add some people that would be able to be um, represented on some of the groups, like in the substance abuse. You want people that really have knowledge on that and to invite some people from um, the MGH along with Chang. It really does um, shape the whole committee to have people that have um, information, knowledge, and experience in it. So um, thank you, Frank. Um, thank you, Dr. Colucci and Cheryl Cole for all the work you've done. Thank you, Mrs. Rizzo. Mm -hmm. uh, any other members have any questions or comments? Okay. 
Okay. Seeing none, uh, Mr. Shea, do you want to continue? Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Dr. Gallucci, if we could just get up that first athletic slide. Uh, so, so first and foremost, you know, I'd like to say that, you know, on behalf of everybody here, I, I know that, you know, I was a high school coach for many years. Um, we're obviously in unprecedented times, and I think that everybody on the committee and um, at the district level and above uh, wants nothing better than to get our kids back out and playing. But, uh, you know, we have to do what's best for everybody and what's safe for everybody. And uh, we met uh, about six weeks ago and i have to say dr kelly uh we met as a gbl great greater boston league and dr kelly had the uh forward thinking of really just suspending everything till after the holidays and what we've now seen even though a lot of our, our neighbors were aggressive and said we're going to start on the 14th of december what we have seen in the last couple of weeks since we made a decision is that a lot of our communities have rolled back to um, rethinking this decision till after the holidays. So um, just some localities that have rolled back since uh, Malden, Everett, Peabody, Salem, uh, Everett, Boston have all um, wanted to start this week and have rolled back till after the holidays. And um, schools like Bishop Fenwick and Andover High School just began and decided to shut down and delay till after the holiday. So um, I just think that was the right call at the time. And then, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll see where we lie at, and, and when that decision's made uh, after the first of the year. Um, if we go to the next slide. So what the MIA has proposed is to try to get everybody some sort of season. Um, these are the proposed dates and sports offered. However, these dates are very flexible. Uh, the MIA is having no uh, tournaments, at least not in, in the fall and winter season. So that allows us to play with these dates even further from what you see. So in other words, if the Greater Boston League decided that we could safely have sports in mid-January, we could offer winter sports and go past the February 21st deadline. Um, if, if the numbers in our community and surrounding communities dictated that we couldn't play in January, we could say we're going to start February 1st and play on into March. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility, which is a good thing. And we're going to do everything we can as a league to try to get our kids on fields um, in all three sports. And if that means moving winter sports to spring or um, Fooling full with the dates a little bit so that maybe the shot, the seasons are a little shorter, but we get more sports in. Uh, those are the discussions we have on a weekly basis, and that's our goal. Uh, next slide, please. So, what the MIA and what the Greater Boston League, what we've come up with is, you know, sports as we know it, if we do play, um, are not really going to look like the sports that we left last winter. There's been many modifications made, both at the district level and at the state level. Um, and each sport will have their own modifications. So the seasons have basically been cut down to half, 50 to 60%. There are no MIA playoffs. Uh, it's the goal that we play one game per week um, with the option, if things are going well, that we can add a second game per week as the season goes on. So that we can, if we can get to 12 games or even 14 games, that would be great. But if things dictate that we only play once a week and we only get six or eight games, then then we go that route. So again, there's more flexibility. Our teams would practice every other day. Um, so our varsity may practice on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Our junior varsity would practice on Tuesday, Thursday. Everyone would play on Saturday. That would be a, um, a, an example of the week. Um, the MIA has limited rosters um, so as not to have too many kids congregating in any one place. Uh, so our rosters have been cut down. Hockey has a maximum of 20 from 22. Basketball is down to 15, even though and it's even recommended to go as low as 12. Mm -hmm. It can only be three coaches uh, 
on the sidelines at any time. And again, that's to limit the amount of personnel on a, on a court or on a, on a surface. Um, and uh, one thing that is, should be noted to all our student athletes that even though we are under these restrictions, all our student athletes are still required to be in compliance with all our Revere High School and MIA guidelines in order to try out, practice, or compete. So you still need a valid physical, you still need a parental consent form, you still need to be academically eligible, um, take the concussion test, et cetera. So um, what we have done is we've opened our registration on final forms and you know we've been encouraging kids to get all that paperwork in so that if and when the time comes when we get the okay to play, that we won't be telling kids to go get physicals at, you know, at that in the 12th hour. So the quicker people get that, those, um, the quicker those students are in compliance, the better off we all are and the quicker we'll be able to. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Um, again, just some examples of travel. Uh, there'd only be one bus per team. Kids would be spaced out. Uh, some communities are, are even just having parental drop-offs and parental pickups. I don't know if that would be something we would do, but it is an option, but they have totally eliminated carpooling. Um, so, you know, you may get a parent who's just not comfortable with their kid being on a bus. So they may want to drop off and pick up. Um, our varsity and junior varsity would play at different sites. So in basketball, for instance, the goal would be to play a varsity boys and girls game at home and the junior varsity boys and girls would play away. Um, uh, go back, please, Rich. Mm -hmm. um, the athletes will be dressed, ready to go. There'll be no locker room uh, use at all. So kids will get off a bus, stretch, go through warm-ups, and um, ready to go. Same thing with officials. Uh, when they return from the weight contests, we, you know, the kids usually will come back into the high school, go into the locker room. All that would be eliminated. Um, students would be picked up in the parking lot and our coaches would be responsible that all kids were picked up and that the coach was the last one to leave. Next slide, please. Uh, so we've had discussion in the Greater Boston League and we feel that, and along with other leagues, our best fan policy at this time, if we were to play, would to have no fans. Uh, this limits the number of people that would come into a facility. It limits um, the amount of interaction we would have to have with people telling them to social distance uh, and, and so forth. It, it just makes sense. It's not ideal, um, but it just makes sense to keep everybody safe and give our kids the safest playing environment. Um, there are options if it were senior night, we've discussed possibly allowing both parents in only. Um, some teams are allowing two people per player um, so if we played a team, say Winthrop, who was not a great Boston League team and Winthrop chose to have fans, um, then there'd be two parents allowed per student athlete. Our uh, hockey rink is equipped with cameras to live stream games. So parents would be able to watch their kids live on live stream. And in, in contests of basketball or swimming, we would work with Revere te Television or um, some of the RHS personnel to get those games taped and fed out to parents live. Uh, again, like I said, everyone will come to games dressed. There, it, this says there will be locker room access, but there will, will be no locker room access, no post-game showering, no post-game handshakes. Uh, bathrooms access will be limited one at a time. So we're just trying to, if and when we're ready to play, that we make things as safe as possible. Next slide, please. Um, so what happened at, at, at the MIA level is all of these protocols went through four committees. Okay, each sports has their own committee, which took sports as we know them and said, how do we make these sports safer? And they came up with certain modifications in each sport. Those sport committees reported to the MIA COVID-19 task force and the MIA sports medicine committee, which consists of doctors and trainers throughout the state. Those two committees signed off on these modifications as being as safe as we possibly can. From there, 
it went to the MIA board of directors who okayed it, and then it came to us. So um, a lot of work was put in at the MIA level in the sport committees and in the district committees to get these um, modifications approved. Um, and, and so just, uh, there's some references at the end of the slideshow where you can go and look more specifically. I didn't want to list all of them because we, we'd be talking all night about it. But just for instance, they've taken away the jump ball in boys and girls basketball to limit contact. Uh, they're allowing only four players in the free throw lane instead of six. They've taken away under the basket inbounds where there's a lot of physical contact. So everything would be a side throw in. Um, there's no, in any contest, you can play the national anthem, but you cannot have a singer to sing the national anthem. Uh, so th there's, there's a lot of different protocols. I just listed a few. Uh, ice hockey, for instance, you know, if you watch an ice hockey game, teams dump the puck in the corner and you get a scrum. You get three, four, five kids going in battling for the puck. What the committee has designated is only two people, one from each team can go in the corner. Once a third player enters the corner, the whistle blows, play is stopped, and there's a face-off. Uh, uh, this is probably the, the biggest modification, and it, it would be our swim meets. Our swim meets would be housed um, uh, virtually. So if we had 20 swimmers, they'd be given a time to show up at the pool. Mm -hmm. They would swim uh, in their own pool. They'd be timed by their coach, and they would shower and leave and then the next swimmer would come in the pool and then uh, at the end of that our coaches would call Malden if we were playing Malden and say these are our times what are your times to determine a winner and uh, definitely a, a diff totally different situation but um, probably the safest of all uh, with limiting numbers of, of kids and not even having an, an opposing team in your building uh, next slide please uh, just some other protocols that, that we're going to put in, we would put in place at all GBL games. Uh, our trainers would temperature check everybody attending the contest. Um, can you, that would be um, opposing players, coaches, TV cameramen, etc. cetera. Um, the National Federation of High School Sports has added a uh, coaching certification. It's basically a, a video that, that talks about COVID and protocols and things of that nature, but um, we've required that now of all our coaches at, at RHS. Uh, so they've all had to take that course and submit a certificate. Um, our compliance tool, which is called Final Forms, part of their um, they, they've created a, a form for coaches that has a, uh, a pre-screening questionnaire so that coaches would go through this questionnaire with their athletes before every practice and be able to um, eliminate students who may have some of the COVID symptoms right away um, before they had contact with any other athlete. Um, benches, seats would be faced six feet apart. Equipment bags have to be six feet apart. Uh, each player has to have their own masks, their own water bottles. Um, the scoring table at basketball or hockey has to have hand sanitizer. Table workers all wear masks. After a game, everything is, is sanitized and wiped down. Uh, like I said before, there's no handshake. After the game, players just meet in the corner with their coaches, socially distance for five minutes, and then off they go. Um, they'd enter through one door to get in the facility, exit through another. Um, if we had a boys game and a girls game back to back, the girls would not be allowed entry or the boys would not be allowed entry until the previous game. All participants of the previous game had exited the facility and the tables and the equipment was disinfected. So, uh, you know, our usual basketball games that start 10 minutes after the previous game would probably be 45 minutes or an hour behind. but. Uh, so there'd be no interaction between teams. Um, <clears throat> we're still talking about, you know, possibly using one venue as kind of a, um, a bubble scenario. If we could keep, you know, one group, um, uh, one facility um, uh, that had stringent protocols that we could keep everybody in that venue, if that helped, we, we've talked about that. We've talked about limiting practice times. 
um, and contact tracing. Those are all part of what we're doing, but they're still in, in our discussions. Next slide. Um, again, so if, if, you, if you want to go in depth, I mean, there's so much material, and as we know, the goalposts have changed every week. It seems like, um, you know, like I said, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, you know, schools were, were really getting ready to play on December 14th, and those, are, those things have changed. So um, I, th I think the easiest place for resources is to go to the MIA site, and there's just an abundance of links there that talk about, you know, all, this, all the different sport modifications, all the EEA guidelines, um, all the stuff from DESE, uh, it, it's all there in one spot. Um, two positive things before I turn it over for questions. Um, when I presented a couple of years ago about joining, leaving the Northeast Conference and going to the Greater Boston League, um, part of our vision in the Greater Boston League was to be able to attract more urban schools. And we can gladly report that beginning fall 2021, that Chelsea, Lynn English, and Lynn Classical will join as members to the Greater Boston League, which is really much sooner than we expected, but it's really a tremendous advantage for our league because we now have eight urban schools that are alike in enrollment, alike in population, are, are alike in demographics, and this was really the vision of all of us uh, just a couple years ago. Um, and, and secondly, um, at the state level, um, as the, the City of Boston Athletic Director Avery Edsdell a couple years ago had a plan to get all urban athletic directors together and meet frequently and come up with some sort of urban voice at the state level. Um, we, we started that work two years ago with Avery, and now there's 32 urban athletic directors. We meet at least once a month, and we were just okayed by the MIA to be an ad hoc committee, which is a big deal because it gives urban kids and urban schools a voice. Um, you know, especially in like a waiver issue where we're going to get a, a waiver for a kid. Uh, sometimes you go up against a panel of three athletic directors, and they're from um, Martha's Vineyard, they're from Marshfield, and they're from Andover. And you just don't have an urban voice there. And, and what this ad hoc committee does is it'll give us a voice, it'll give us some represent, representation at the state level for our kids. And um, the, the hopes going forward are is that uh, we strengthen that voice uh, in the coming years. But with, with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Uh, again, I just wanted to give you as much information as possible as you make these tough decisions on whether we play and when we play. But I just thought that, um, you know, the more information, the more information on protocols um, that's out there will, will help guide your decision as, as we get into a safer zone and, and in the weeks ahead. Thank you, Frank. Uh, any uh, members have any comments or questions? Chairman. Mr. Franzi. Frank, that's uh, quite a um, speech that you gave. Uh, it's very informative of what happened. But I think that they put so many restrictions in the games. They don't become games anymore. I mean, games are physical. Hockey, basketball, football. They're physical games. You can't get around it. And to make the rules that they've made, it's just like like hamstringing. I know they're playing. I get that. We want them to play, but there's just so many hands, so many hamstrings. What happens if guys have to be taped, their ankles, or whatever? Where do they tape the kids? So, first of all, Mr. Franti, that's a great question, and that's obviously a question that we've struggled with. Is that we we want to give kids the opportunity to play the sports that they love, but we have to keep them safe as well. So. That is the, the view of many, that some of the restrictions have gone overboard. Um, but I think at this point, if we can get kids out playing at some point and active and engaging again, I think that would be the goal. And then hopefully we can limit uh, those restrictions as this virus, uh, the numbers come down and, and we start to get through it. As far as the taping question, so kids would be taped by the athletic trainer. 
uh, in an area of the facility. So we, we would probably have a training table set up in the field house, um, but it would be on a one-to-one -one basis. And then after each kid left that table, that table would have to be wiped down by the trainer and, and disinfected before the next kid was able to come, come in. Now that becomes an issue when you're talking about a sport of football, when you may have 60 kids getting their ankles taped, right? So that would be a tremendous amount of work. We are very fortunate in Revere to have two trainers, Keith and Nate, Do uh, Keith Career and Nathan Dory, who would help limit that work. But it would still be a, a, a giant task for those, and that is also a concern as we go forward. That we want to keep our trainers safe because trainers are so scarce and so valuable, and we don't want to overwhelm them with a tremendous amount of work. But that would be how it would work for a basketball contest. Uh, we would ask that opposing teams come taped before they enter the facility so that, say, Keith would only be taping our athletes prior and not have to worry about the opposing team unless there was, of course, an injury or something of that nature during the game. My last question, Frank, is there any chance that maybe some of the restrictions will come off as the seasons go along? Uh, this is just embedded. This is what we're doing this year, and that's it. I, I think that everybody has an open mind to this. I mean, again, whatever restrictions come off have to go through the MIA Sports Medicine Committee and the Board of Directors. But I think if we came to a place where we had a number of percentage of people were vaccinated and, you know, these, this thing was really going away, I think you may see some of the restrictions go away. Uh, but right now, that's what they've deemed we have to play under because to the safety issue and the numbers. So. Okay. so there is flexibility if there is something that can be done to help out they will do it. Yes, I think, you know, they continue to meet on a monthly, if not a monthly basis, uh, and, and we'll look at these things. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Franti. Uh, any other members? Carol. Ms. Sai? You're on mute, Ms. Sai. Uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Thank you. Um, I really like what you said about the committee of urbans uh, being together because I feel it so many times people from, you know, the outskirts of Boston really don't understand what kids are like and what happens, you know, in the quote inner city and that you might need someone there who has a real understanding of the difficulties that some of these kids go through. And uh, so having a committee such as that of people who will understand our kids, not all of them, but understand that some kids just have a harder time than others and to be flexible and not to say this is it and we can never change it. So um, thanks for leading the way on that. I know you did. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chai. Any other members? Mrs. Gravelisi has her hand up. Sorry, Mrs. Gravelisi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Frank, um, do you feel it's gonna be difficult? Pretty much you're gonna have to be retraining these athletes, their instinctive habits, just say for instance, like you know, two hockey players in the corner. Instinctively, this is what they've always done. And your practices are so going to be so limited. Do you feel you're going to have a difficult time retraining them to be able to follow these guidelines? That's a great question. Uh, you know, you know, just looking back at when this pandemic hit, we were in such a great spot athletically. We were coming off of just a fan. Yeah year mm -hmm. um, and, and now it's almost like we have to rebuild things step by step I, I do think the kids are resilient and they will be able to adapt but you are right that you know just diving into a regular drill or a regular practice uh, for coaches is going to look totally different because they are going to have to do some time with rule revisions and modifications and uh, you know the officials are aware of this as well um, so the officials have gone through trainings as to what they're going to look for. And, and they know that, you know, maybe in the first game, the kids are going three and four in the corner for puck, but you know, the hope is, is that they'll get used to it and they'll adjust to the, the new rules and modifications, but it, it'll be a challenge. 
Thank you. Any other members? Scrolling back and forth. Right. Mr. Sinella. Mr. Sinella? Yes. Uh, Frank, on uh, hockey, for example, where the uh, limitations of rinks, um, how is that going to play out? And we were in conjunction with a couple of other schools. Um, we would be able to put the teams together. So another great question. So yeah, so for some people that may be watching that aren't aware, we, we do a co-op team with Malden and Matinon. So the concern of just a few weeks ago was what happens if Malden and Matinon can play and we can't. And I think um, myself and Dr. Kelly uh, both agree that, you know, we don't feel like we would hold Malden or Matinon back from playing if, if they were in a different situation than us uh, with the hopes that our kids would somehow be able to join uh, at a certain point. Um, but since we've had that discussion, all three schools now, Matt not included, have pushed back the start of sports. So that will be a discussion we'll have to make as we get past the new year and see where each community is at. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, what was, uh, your first question had to do with the, the, the rink time, the, the, the ice time is limited. I mean, back when I was in high school, you had the Westland and Revere was practicing three o'clock in the morning. I mean, you know, uh, they've got a few rinks. MDC's got rinks, but I think that's maybe a problem. Uh, only practicing twice a week could, you know, but I, I, something you're going to have to work out if you, if you, uh, if, if we get accepted or whatever the case is, the okay, then the rest of it's logistics, and that's where you guys come in. Right. So I have been in, I have been in contact with John Carroll, who's the rink manager at Cronin, and, and basically all we've done is we've canceled our ice time up until the fourth of January. So they are reserving the ice time for us in the event that we can play. And like I said, if it's not the fourth that we can play, and it's February first, possibly that I he said it will be there. So uh, we're in a good place there. Uh, and also being part of the co-op with Malden and Matinon, we also have the options of, of traveling to those communities as well, if, if we need okay. it. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ryan, I know that the mayor is trying to change devices. I think he lost battery in one. So Ryan, you had a, a question or a comment? Yeah, um, Mr. Shea, as a fall and spring student athlete, the model that you went over as far as pertaining to the winter sports are we expecting a similar model for the fall and uh, the spring sports as well? Or is that something that's going to be left up for um, further discussion? Or is there any progress sort of on the, um, the fall and the spring seasons pertaining like kind of those um, new rules and regulations that have already been decided? Yes. Yeah, so thank you, Ryan, for the question. Um, so right, I believe right after the holidays, the individual getting late individual sports committees will start to discuss sport modifications for the winter for the fall two season um so you will see those probably roll out the first week in february but yes there will be modifications as well i would think as we get into the spring that the modifications may come back a little bit as we're outdoors and again we're, we're hopefully you know, bottoming out from this virus. Um, but I would expect in fall two season for there to be similar restrictions to the ones we see in the winter. Thank you. You're welcome. This is Rizzo. And just to say, um, Thursday MIAA's meeting um, under the agenda, one is the proposed spring um, alignments or um, what we would call um, any changes that might need to be made. So at least they'll start talking um, Thursday about it. So that's good. Get ahead of this, ahead of everything. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. I know this has been a challenging year yeah, we'll get through it. We're almost there. 
one of, one of the things that uh, Frank and I have talked about is, um, and as we've talked about as a committee, uh, making sure that we are following the guidance of the more knowing people around us, including our, especially our health officials, uh, but also the DESI and MIAA officials who um, really are guiding this work and um, spending time to think carefully about it. And I think it's important that we stay the course on that. Um, one thing that uh, DESE differentiates is districts that are in hybrid learning models versus full remote. Um, and you know that's something that we can think about down the road. It's not going to happen right now, but we will continue to look at numbers and see where we are as a community um, over the coming weeks so that we can make a real time decision as soon as we're able to. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Okay. Uh, so we're gonna go next to um, the food services update and I wanna um, thank, uh, oh, actually, sorry. I see um, member uh, Anthony D'Ambrosio has a hand up. Sorry about that, thank you. I was hoping we could go back very quickly because I'm getting a few questions about it um, to the ventilation presentation. Um, very quickly, uh, if that's all right. Um, the questions I'm getting is whether or not we can clarify um, whether the buildings in general are safe for the current occupancy of one to two teachers and uh, you know how that's gonna change as the MERV 13 filters are required for uh, regular occupancy within the Garfield. So thank you. Yeah, and I, and I have to say that people should, if they didn't have a chance to watch it uh, last month, uh, Mr. Svensson did uh, an excellent presentation on that at the school committee meeting. Um, that meeting is available on the school committee's YouTube channel. And uh, I would encourage anybody with questions about ventilation to take the time to look at that. Um, but the answer to the question is, uh, right now all of our classrooms across the district are entirely safe um, for, it, and it varies based on the ventilation system, in our newer buildings up to 30 people in a room. Our, um, a couple of the schools are at like more like a 15, 17 number, uh, which isn't sufficient for us when we come back to a hybrid learning model um, and still require these number of air exchanges. And when we install the MERV 13 filters, that's what's gonna get us up to that 30, 35 number, which we, which we shouldn't have anyway, but uh, in terms of the number of humans who can be in a room. Um, and that's what all of this work is about. But none of our rooms have ever been um, unsafe. That was never a question all the way back to the summer. Um, our ventilation systems have always worked as they were designed to. The challenge that we ran into at the uh, Beachmont, the Garfield and the high school only uh, was that those systems were designed to optimize temperature and not air exchanges. And that's where we had to make some adjustments to those systems, which we did. Um, and, and we're all in really good shape. As I mentioned, the one thing that we do wanna do at the high school is add a air filter system in each classroom. Um, and that will add uh, two more air exchanges, which gets us over that number of 30 for occupancy level. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Kelly, you wanna continue with the superintendent's sure. report? Yeah, up next we have the uh, food service report, um, sorry, food service update. Uh, and with us is Cheryl Cole, who is, as you all know well, um, manages our food service program. Um, and she has a presentation that she's, go that she's gonna share. And I'm gonna bring it up on my machine now. Hopefully you can all see that. And Cheryl, I'll take it away. Good evening, everyone. I realize it's late. Um, I'd like to just take a couple minutes just to talk about our food service program, where we were and um, what it looks like in the near future is what we hope. Um, I have been the food service director for Revere Public Schools. This is my ninth year. Um, oh. <laughs> hard to believe. <laughs> <laughs> one thing, one thing that stands out in my mind when I came to Revere and where we are now, um, our priorities were to provide a quality meal service program 
for our students that was designed for our students and more so now than ever, um, the program being designed for our students is what matters most. Um, the financial impact of COVID-19 to our meals program last year was reported. Um, there were many steps that were taken um, to assist us in controlling the financial outcome for this year. I'm very proud to say those steps are working. Um, the report that I'm gonna cover will cover uh, a current program overview, what we've achieved and what we're looking to do and actions being taken to prepare for our students when they return. Um, I would like to just take a minute to give a shout out to the Re Revere Public Schools Food Service employees. Um, this is a group of employees that deserve to be recognized for their accomplishments and their willingness to adapt to an ever-changing meals program. Um, this has been the case since last March and they just continue to amaze me. Um, and Cheryl, I, if I could jump in there for yep. just a second. Um, I have to say that there was a, an article in the Globe today that um, kind of painted our food service program in a negative light. Uh, it was really disappointing to read and it was very uh, biased, one person's opinion. Um, I, I want to reiterate what Cheryl just said. Our food service workers have done yeoman's work over the, the last mm -hmm. of months since the pandemic started. We closed schools on a Friday and they started their uh, grab and go meals that Monday. Um, they have pivoted all along the way. And with the help of uh, many volunteers, teachers, social workers, guidance counselors, um, paraprofessionals, and you know, even over the summer, Stacey Rizzo and Michael Ferranti played a huge role in our food delivery program, um, which has been in place since the very beginning so that we could uh, deliver meals to the homes of families that were really struggling. And we could not have done any of that without our food service workers. So we're very proud and fortunate to have them as part of our team. And I, I really hope that any of them who happen to see that article today uh, don't take that as uh, the true impression of how people feel about their work. It's not. Thank you, Diane. Um, if we could switch to the next slide. Okay. So um, if we look back to last spring, the program jumping through hoops and, and like um, Dr. Kelly stated, we put systems in place first to ensure the staff safety, um, but also being able to provide essential services to our families. Um, the program transitioned over in the summer to a summer feeding program um, with still limited sites. Um, I am very happy to say that the summer, fee uh, summer food service program did run a, an extremely successful program despite all the challenges that the staff um, did face as well. Uh, this fall, our full-time staff returned um, there were a few part-time employees who did not take the voluntary furlough. So we opened our schools. We increased the distribution sites to include all elementary locations. Um, and one of the things that we have really been working on is expanding our community outreach opportunities. If you can go to the next slide. So one of the things that we knew was important um, to increase meal participation, we needed to change our operations to be able to serve the needs of the students and the families. So as of right now, and I'm hoping that this is the plan that continues, um, students will receive a week's worth of meal um, that is distributed two times per week. As of right now, it's on Tuesday and Friday and takes place at all elementary school locations. The distribution times are from 10.30 to one o'clock, which do align with students' lunch breaks. Um, by collaborating with, I have to give a shout out to um, the transportation department, um, the other Revere programs that we have utilized, we have really been able to um, assist families that may be in a quarantine situation um, and provide food to those families um, through a meal delivery service. As of right now, we're servicing 28 families um, and providing meals to 58 students because of that collaboration. 
Community outreach is something that we continue to improve on. Um, and I feel it can only get better. Um, we have reached out to several different organizations within the city. And I also would like to thank them for all of their support in helping us provide a successful meal program so far. If we can um, go to the next slide. What we're doing is we are trying to build the meals program. I have to say it's, it's challenging. It's a different model. We're, we're serving multiple days of meals, no longer in a cafeteria environment. And we all eat with our eyes. Um, so it's very difficult to make meals look appealing. Um, and that is something, again, kudos to the staff. Um, we are continuing to adapt our menus keep students engaged and um, develop family style meals too that work out better is what we're finding in these situations. The outreach programs, again, um, we have expanded our program to include Youth in Motion or the For Kids Only After School program. We've expanded our programs to reach our alphabet students that are now um, at our locations. Um, these are just some pictures of the meals that are being served to students throughout the district. One of the things, I'm sorry, if we could go back, um, I know that there are also um, families that are residing in temporary housing. It's important for the committee members to know that we are also able to provide meals to those families as well. Um, those are through the efforts of Doug Goodwin, an amazing team of people that he works with. Our menus have always included fresh fruits and vegetables, um, and they continue to do so. One thing that we're finding also is by doing those family style fruits and vegetables, it does work out better for the families at the distribution site. It's just a snapshot of the menu so far. Um, one thing that I think is really important because right now our interaction with our parents um, is something that I've never experienced so much of in a school meals program. And in most cases, that's because it is the parents that are coming to our meal distribution site. Open communication happens. Um, we've collaborated with the Revere Fire Department um, with a PP um, program. Um, our Thanksgiving meal distribution included uh, meals that were based on family style where, you know, sweet potatoes and potatoes and carrots and vegetables were included, hopefully to assist our families to make um, their holiday meal better. Ever change in times, communication is key. Um, so we have used our outreach um, and continue to hopefully reach all members of the community. Um, there are flyers and posters and banners and calls that are being made and social media posts where we're constantly communicating potential changes and menus. Um, election day was one of the days that there was a disruption in the regular meal service. So what we needed to do was be sure that our families knew that the meal distribution had changed. Um, as we approach the winter months, these means of communication are going to be extremely important um, with weather forecast and, and the possibility of needing to swap distribution days to accommodate the weather challenges that we face here in New England. This is just a snapshot of many of the, uh, again, community uh, members that are playing a part and participating in our meal program. Here's a snapshot of one of our amazing teams. Um, how we get it done, there's six meal pickup locations throughout the district. We are operating with seven operational sites. We are currently serving three th on average 3,430 meals a day. We have served 260, over 265,000 meals since September 1st. And that's all being done through 31 employees that are serving our school community. This is a graph to show where we were, uh, where the meals currently are, and you can see an increase in meal participation. And again, many, many different areas that have uh, contributed to that success. 
And I'll add when Cheryl talked to us over the summer about the meals program, uh, and we were talking about the community eligibility provision and how the reimbursements work there. Um, we were worried about making um, the cutoffs that would mean the program would break even. And um, we'll talk more about this in our full financial update in January. Um, but we are in good shape. We have reached the numbers that Cheryl had said. These are our goalposts so that we can uh, make sure that we are uh, not operating in the red. And uh, so that's been a very positive outcome as well. So along with operating the program, there are um, many things that are happening behind the scenes to, to prepare for the time when our students do come back into the buildings. Um, whatever model that will be, we are prepared. Um, if we start out in a hybrid situation, um, there will be points of service in place to accommodate any um, suggestions or, or um, suggestions that are put forth at that time um, based on knowledge on COVID-19 at that time. Um, when the time does come and all students are back in the building again, we have taken steps so that we are prepared for those situations. So just to let everyone know that back in June, a um, little bit proactive, um, I had started to look at some purchases of equipment um, that would be necessary um, looking ahead at the fall season. So we were able to secure a lot of equipment. Um, they have been sitting in our building since September. Unfortunately, we are still in the 100% remote situation, um, but we have not experienced any shortage of equipment. We are ready to go whenever um, the district decides again to either go hybrid or have all students return back to the building. Um, I, I just want to say in closing, so I look forward to our continued partnership. And again, there's still many unknowns, but I can tell you that uh, myself along with the team, uh, we will get it done and continue to service the families of our community. Thank you, Cheryl. Any members have any questions or comments? Uh, I see Mrs. Ms. Ty Rizzo. and Mrs. Rizzo. Yep, Mrs. Rizzo. Casey. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Um, Cheryl, I, I really, I can't say enough about you and the team. Um, I've always had respect for any of the cafeteria workers since my kids were in school because I know it's just a lot of work. Um, and sometimes it, it's not a thankful job. Um, but your team and getting to work with them um, last March has given me more respect than I can ever think I would have. Um, and with your guidance and the way they look up to you, um, it's just an honor to have had the opportunity to work with um, all of you. And the Boston Globe, I canceled mine last week, so I don't care what they have to say. Um, just thank you very much for what you do, what the team does, and what you do for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Rizzo. Uh, Ms. Chai? Yeah, Cheryl, thank you for all you do. And thank you, Stacy. I know how hard you have been working on this. I was looking at the um, the slide or um, the page that says keeping our school community connected. Yeah. And I, I don't want you to go through everybody and how we're connected with anyone. But I know, for example, how difficult it is to get things out because we used to have a program through Project Red and through St. Vincent de Paul at Immaculate Conception at Christmas and uh, Thanksgiving and Easter. And we of course have not been able to do that this year. Um, so it's, it's really, um, I really admire you that you are able to you work with all of these people. But could I just ask you a couple of questions? Like, I mean, I, I would imagine, I know how you do everything with the Revere Public Schools website and the, and the Parent Information Center, but like, how are you connected with MGH 
and the CHA and, uh, and what do you work, how do you work back and forth with North Suffolk mental health? Is it in providing, in providing meals for their community or are they more involved than that? I apologize if, if this was misleading. Um, no reason for you to apologize okay. for anything. Thank you. Um, but what I found was most important is just to reach our target audience. And that is very, very difficult to do in a pandemic situation. Um, right. There's so many resources in this city. Um, and what we wanted to do was to tap into those resources and utilize their already established outreach programs. So just uh -huh. simple communications by um, sending them um, our menus and our distribution site information and any special meal promotions. And, and then basically what's happening is our information is being reposted through their resources. And since utilizing all of that, I, I do believe that that has increased participation too. Um, we're able to reach more community members and I just hope that um, these systems continue to grow. So if there is anyone else that you are not seeing that you feel that we could work in collaboration with, um, please, please let the food services department know um, because there's many people that may not be aware of this service that we certainly want to have them be able to take advantage of it as well. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Ms. Chai. Uh, any other members? Mr. Franti. Uh, Cheryl, I want to thank you for what you and your staff do. I was fortunate to help you guys out last spring, and you guys worked so hard. And to push out over 250,000 meals in a short period of time is just an incredible feat. You should, you should be very proud for what you guys do. Yeah. My only question, my only question is that are all your costs reimbursed by the federal government and state? So the way that the reimbursements work. Um, we are reimbursed for every meal that we serve, depending on the meal type served. So um, if we were to take the number of breakfast times the federal reimbursement rate for breakfast, and it's a different reimbursement rate for lunch. So ideally, when I reported to this committee um, back in May, our reimbursements, you know, were not larger than program cost. Um, we are in a position right now where we are running um, in the black, it's, it's not a large amount, but you know, what, what we're trying to achieve in years past, what we try to do with the meal program is run it so it is successful, but so that we can con con um, continue to invest in our program um, into doing equipment upgrades, to save the district from, you know, huge maintenance bills. Um, what we're trying to do this year is just be able to provide this essential service to the community members um, and be able to pay the bills, to be honest with you. So okay. we Thank have reached that point. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Franti. Any other members? No. Uh, thank you, Cheryl, for your work. I, I know that Globe article um, really di didn't paint a full picture of the great work that's been done. And, and right. Dr. Kelly uh, hit the nail on the head, but uh, it was really disappointing to see that kind of um, that kind of angle taken, given all the all the tremendous work that you and your team have done, and I think all the tremendous work the city's done. You know, you you mentioned all the partnerships that you've had. Um, I know members of the school committee who have helped out on, on, in food delivery, members of the city council who have as well. And, uh, you know, our community has stepped up to help people out and um, that didn't get across in that article and that was really uh, unfortunate, so. Thank you, ma'am. But your, 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 your team and, and you have done amazing work uh, during really challenging times, so thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, all right, so the next thing we have, and we're going to try to go a little bit more quickly, I do want to just remind the committee that we um, are supposed to be meeting in an executive session after this meeting, and uh, Mr. Dominello is available until nine o'clock, so um, we, I just want to see if we can um, 
Of try to make it in time to speak to him. Um, so uh, Richie's going to take us very quickly through the social and emotional learning initiative that we're partnering with um, Sandy Hook Promise on. Dr. Gallucci, you're uh, muted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Get Ivan in Sorry. here. To... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we are in the middle of a three-year partnership with the um, Sandy Hook Promise organization. Uh, they focus on social emotional education and violence prevention. Uh, they promote safety while preventing school violence, identify and explain best practices for school violence prevention and advocate for laws that keep our students safe. More than anything, they have a proactive approach uh, that focuses on mental health and wellness as a means of uh, reducing and preventing um, violence. Uh, so last year as a principal, I participated in the first uh, leg of the three-year partnership. Um, it was an assembly for all three middle schools and the high school, it's called Start With Hello. Uh, it teaches uh, students how to recognize when someone is uh, socially isolated or experiencing loneliness. Um, and very simple message of starting with hello, the kids went through uh, role play uh, and were able to engage in conversations in front of their student body. They did a great job with it. Um, this year, we are moving to uh, the second leg, which is uh, um, obviously a bit more serious in nature. Uh, it's signs of suicide. Uh, it obviously uh, deals with instances where um, there is a, a much heavier um, recognition of depression, loneliness, and potential um, suicidal ideation. So just to back up a bit, uh, the Sandy Hook Promise um, Club, after each leg of the three-year partnership, provides resources so that the uh, concepts that are presented live on in the secondary schools, the middle schools and the high school. Uh, so each school identifies a club that lends itself to this topic uh, and Sandy Hook Promise provides that club with resources that provide activities for the students, content for um, the club advisors. Uh, for instance, at my former school, the Rumney Marsh Academy, our anti-bullying coalition uh, was the club that was designated for this work. And you can see uh, the other clubs as well listed at the middle schools and high school. Richie, I don't think we're seeing your slideshow. Are you sharing? I was. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. It's all right. It's been a long day. <laughs> Can you see now? Yes. All right, so I'm gonna back up to the slide just so you can take a peek. Uh, these, quickly, quickly. Yep, these are the clubs that uh, the, the um, Sandy Hook Promise resources exist in. So the goals of the upcoming workshop, the Signs of Suicide workshop, are to um, educate staff members um, how, uh, how to recognize some of the risk factors um, what goes into a mental health screening. That does not mean that all staff members are gonna be conducting health, mental health screenings. Uh, but for our purposes, if you know what a mental health screening entails and you're able to recognize the signs of depression or loneliness or potential suicidal ideation, um, it, 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 it builds your toolbox to where you can communicate more effectively with our support staff who will actually be conducting um, those uh, health assessments. For application in schools, um, we are gonna be training uh, an administrator, uh, health teachers, phys ed teachers, our school adjustment counselors, our guidance counselors, and our nurses from each of the three middle schools in the high school. They are gonna serve as our um, training teams. Uh, they will conduct some professional development for our staff at our staff meetings. And ultimately, uh, kind of a long-term goal is to infuse uh, this content into the health curriculum. Um, that will obviously be a very careful process um, where we will work with um, our director as well as all of the members of this team to be sure that the curriculum is uh, appropriate for students. My kind of first initial reaction to this was, oh my gosh, talking to middle school students about suicide uh, is risky because it might put an idea in their head. One of the uh, first facets they address is that that is a common myth 
And the fact is uh, that you do not give morbid ideas in talking about this topic. And in fact, bringing up the subject um, really um, changes people's thinking about depression and um, uh, suicide uh, in itself. And so that is gonna be something that is kind of the third leg of the second year process. And um, that training is gonna take place on January 13th of the new year. And I certainly will have updates after that. And Dr. Gallucci, we would also do a workshop for parents um, prior to introducing this content in health classes to students. Correct. Any members have any comments? Will we be getting, Mr. Mayor? Ms. Shai. Uh, Dr. Gallucci, um, mm -hmm. will we be getting copies of this? I, I find this very interesting. I get emails from Sandy Hook all the time and I continue to be amazed at their dedication and um, and, and so horrified at the anguish they are going through. Absolutely, and I can provide some resources that they have provided me so you can see the materials. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other members? Seeing none, we'll uh, continue on, Dr. Kelly. Thank you. The uh, next item is uh, results of our family, student, and staff surveys. Um, I'm going to start with the family survey, then the staff survey, and then Ryan is actually going to help me um, present to you the student survey. Um, and these survey results will be on the website. I didn't have time to get them up today, but we will work on that uh, tomorrow. So um, let me start with um, the family survey. All right, and you can all see that, I hope. Um, so uh, I, we asked a number of questions of families and um, I just wanted to highlight uh, some of the ones um, that, uh, that we had responses for. Uh, we really asked parents to focus on letting us know what resources kids had, what resources they didn't have, what, where we needed to help them with that, um, and help us identify areas of our own work that we need to improve on. So this first question, as you can, as you can see, is about internet access. And um, we're glad to see that the vast majority have reliable, well-working internet. I should mention that over 3,100 parents responded on behalf of over 3,800 students. So we're over a 50% response rate, which is incredible statistically. Um, but we do still have identified here 20 kids that do not have internet access. And um, with all of, this, all of these responses, we can um, we identify who the family is that responded that way. And um, principals have this data for their schools and we'll be reaching out to families to try to help um, close the gaps that still exist where they exist in terms of uh, resources and, and, and what people need and all of those pieces. Um, we asked how satisfied parents are with the level of communication from their schools. Um, and again, for the most part, this is very, very positive. Um, as most people say, communication has either been excellent or good. Um, we do have a handful of people, 46 out of the uh, 3,800 who said uh, they received too little communication. Um, and this one here I actually can see is mislabeled. This is supposed to be, I received too much communication. Um, it's, all, it's typically the case that um, some people feel that way. Trying to find the happy medium. Um, we asked um, parents how pleased they are with their child's engagement. And you can see the responses, the descriptions of the responses in the um, legend on the right. Um, we are at 68% very happy with their child's engagement, um, 22 somewhat and 10% not pleased at all. Um, and again, these are the folks that principals and assistant principals will be reaching out to, to try to improve that rate. 
Um, and then we asked parents to talk about their synchronous time and their asynchronous time. And I was really glad that we had asked these questions on our survey because I was able to use this data in my testimony to the Board of Education today. And uh, what I actually said to them uh, when they were passing their uh, resolution that we should have to increase our synchronous time, that that does not uh, jibe with the feedback that we have from families. We are only 12% felt like there's too little synchronous time and 88% of the families felt otherwise. Uh, they also um, said that, Jesse said in our report that we have too much asynchronous time. Only 7% of families feel that way. 93% um, feel, well, 81% say we're right on target. 12% uh, um, say that they actually have too little asynchronous time. So when Desi's saying that we have too much, this is our data that refutes that. We asked about the amount of work assigned. You can see the results here. Again, very fav favorable. Uh, and then uh, we asked about the amount of feedback they're getting on their child's progress. And this is an area that we identified. And I mentioned this in our school committee meeting last Wednesday that um, this really shows us that this is an area um, that we should work on a little bit. Um, it's great that one third of parents are extremely satisfied um, and 51% are satisfied. Uh, I feel like we, I wish we had a few more of these folks in the extremely satisfied category. So there is some work that we can do uh, around this piece. But it's still great to see that 84% um, are either satisfied or extremely satisfied. Uh, and, and then we asked uh, for our final question. We asked about uh, the social emotional well being of um, children. And you can see the results here. It's really split about in half, uh, maybe a little more than half, are leaning toward the somewhat or extremely concerned. Uh, and this is helpful to us, again, as we do re outreach to our parents. Um, the schools will know exactly uh, which students were identified here by their parents for extreme concern and even for somewhat concern and can guide their social workers and guidance counselors and other support staff um, directly to these kids so that we can begin outreach if we haven't already um, and really see if there are things that we can do to better support these kids. Um, and make sure that they're okay throughout the pandemic. So I'll stop sharing now. Those are the highlights uh, from the family survey. And I any, guess maybe I can ask, go ahead, Brian. I was gonna say, if any members have any comments or questions, uh, Mr. Sinella. Just one, Diane, you mentioned that there's a, a group that have no access What's the reason they don't have access? Well, that's what we have to explore because we've been surveying peer, uh, parents. Like when we surveyed everybody in um, August, we had almost 100% response rate. We had principals reaching out to everybody. And uh, we thought we had entirely closed that gap in, um, in access, but things could have changed over the months. So somebody who had um, Comcast in August and September and said, I'm good, I have my internet, something might've changed, whether they moved or um, somehow lost their subscription for a variety of reasons. Um, anything could have happened that, that makes them now not have access. Fortunately, we have um, the subscriptions that we bought through our CARES funding um, and we'll be able to connect with those families and get them reassociated. Well, that's what I, I knew that there was some progress that uh, monetary uh, mo you know, monies were made available so yes. that everyone should have it. So it yeah. sounds to me that if there is a nucleus that doesn't have it, then it seems to be their problem, not our problem. Well, and it might be just a piece that we have to connect with them and let them know directly that we have that, um, we have that piece available for them and just get them, get them hooked up with the service. So there are only, only 20 of them, right? So out of 8,000 students or 3,800. No, 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 no. I mean, I'm, what, 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 what galls me is they know the kid needs it, they should be reaching out to you to say, look, we don't have it because of X, Y, and Z, and then we rectify it. You're trying to look at a crystal ball, guessing how come you don't have it? No one, I, I, Yeah, 
Well, we'll reach out to them and find the and find the answer. I'm glad that they responded on the survey, so now we know okay. um, and can move forward. All right. Well, let's get going because we time wise. I'm sorry. I know. I know. That's all right. Um, I'm going to go now to the staff survey. Um, Um, and we had um, 750 staff members out of just under 1,200 completed the survey. Um, and they each had, we had differentiated surveys based on the roles that they played. Um, and you can see them here. We had a teacher survey, administrative survey, coach survey, support staff survey. And you can see all the groups of people that fall in those categories. Um, and then we had a, a broader group called other staff um, who we also surveyed. And I just wanted to, highlight this for a second and give you a chance to look at that slide because some of the data I'm about to show is going to be differentiated by or disaggregated by um, these different categories. So one of the things that we really wanted to know from all of our employees is whether or not they feel supported um, and make sure that we're not just talking about the social emotional well-being of our students but also the social emotional well-being of our staff. Um, that's something that's also very important to us. Um, and from teachers, 70% uh, said they are either supported or very supported. And again, we'd like to see more of these folks who said supported and the very supported. Um, you know, we have a little bit of room to work on here, um, especially because 28% said that they um, feel only somewhat supported. Uh, and I think that has to do with the stress and anxiety of their job right now, but uh, it I, helps us identify a place that we need to work on. Um, support staff uh, were felt more positive. We're at 83% feel very supported or supported. And again, those are our OTs, PTs, speech, social workers, guidance counselors, those folks. Our other staff um, feel, I guess I'd say even more supported. Um, they're actually at uh, 80%, uh, if I'm doing my math correctly, um, feeling um, supported by their school. And again, we can look back and see um, who the couple of people are that are not feeling supported and try to reach out to them and um, help engage them a little bit more, see if there's something else we can do to support them. Um, we wanted to know from a staff perspective if they understand what resources are available for families and how to connect students and families to those resources. Um, so we asked them a slightly different question for um, each of the categories, the teachers. We asked uh, how much they agreed with the statement, I know we had to direct families for resources. And uh, pretty strong results there over 90% um, agreed or strongly agreed. Uh, with administrators, uh, we asked them how strongly they agree that uh, families effectively utilize school resources and um, that's 100% in the agreement or strongly agree category. We asked support staff if they feel connected to the school community so that they're able to help families find resources for basic needs. And this, um, this is referring more to the kind of groups that Cheryl talked about in her presentation. Um, do our social workers know about CAPIC and about um, Revere Cares and MGH and all of the different pieces that are out there, North Suffolk Mental Health, so that they can help um, families and students find those resources if they need them. And again, very strong response rate here. Um, we've got 92% that agree or strongly agree in that category. And then for our other staff, um, so our custodians, our secretaries, our transportation security, all of those folks, do they know how to refer families if they need help? And again, we're at 89% um, they knew what to do. I felt like they knew what, they, what to do. Um, we asked teachers if their school leaders uh, give them the support that they need personally, professionally. And uh, we've got 88% said absolutely or, uh, or I agree or I strongly agree. 
So that is a good result. Again, we, will, we can reach out to those teachers who responded differently than that and try to provide the supports that they need. Um, we asked everybody if they felt like they'd been receiving consistent messaging about our response to COVID. Um, and 82% felt like felt they agreed or strongly agreed. When I asked for help, I received timely support. 92% agreed or strongly agreed. Um, and then we asked folks about their communication. Uh, and this is more for us to get a sense of um, who people are talking to and when. So for teachers, um, we've got just, you know, 29% said that they've spoken to 80 to 100% of their families in the last week. For administrators, you can see their results, support staff. and coaches. And those are academic coaches, not athletic coaches, just to clarify. Another um, question about communication. This time among staff members. And that's the end. Any questions on the staff survey? Mr. Ferranti. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Diane, just two quickies. When you said 750 responded, did you say it was about a third of the staff responded, the percentage? No, I said that's more than half. We have uh -huh. a, I think we're at 1,159 okay. staff members total. It looks like that the worst numbers are the communication. And I think that's something that needs to really get fixed as soon as possible because the numbers were really all over the place. So I yeah. think that's something that we really have to work on with everybody, not just you know the parents, the teachers, probably with the you know with everybody because that seems to be the biggest problem. I'm sure you hear it more than once. Yeah, that definitely, that definitely job. something that that uh, that we should work on a little bit more. Um, I will say that the teachers reported their communication with families at a lower rate than what the families reported their communication from teachers right. were. Yeah. So there's a perception piece there too, you know, and right. I think that uh, reflects some teachers being a little bit harder on themselves um, than they probably should be. But, you know, it's definitely with the, with the parents, they felt like the communication was great. 92% said they, um, they felt that the communication was good or very good. That's coming from parents, right? where they felt they wanted more information was on their child's progress. So a little bit of a, of a different thing. And um, I think that a piece of that might also be a function of the changes we did to standards-based grading instead yeah. of mastery-based grading mm -hmm. instead of our traditional grading system. Um, you know, that could yeah. be reflected in there. Yeah. All right. Our third survey, Ryan. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, we've else. only got 20 minutes till nine o'clock. Can this be, let's go into an executive session. We can always come back to the meeting. Would, I mean, would members prefer to go into executive session and then come back to the regular meeting? Can, it, can I, I just suggest if we're going to do I'd that, like can we Ryan let Ryan just, do his piece? Yeah, um, I, I prefer yes, that Ryan goes please. for us. And, and then we could maybe report, let, him, let him Let go. him do his report so we can yep. go. Okay. So we'll go very quickly. Um, Ryan, I'm bringing up the student survey now. So we had um, 4,096 students respond to the survey, which again, a uh, pretty good number. It's uh, more than yeah. half of our enrolled stu students. And of course, we didn't um, we didn't give the survey to students below grade three, um, so it really is a representative sample. Um, and the first question we asked was how comfortable they are with doing their schoolwork remotely, and uh, we broke this data out by grade bands so that we could look at um, the elementary kids, which is grades three, four, and five, the middle school, and the high school. 
And uh, Ryan and I went over this a little bit um, yesterday, was it Ryan, that we met? Yeah. Yeah. And um, it struck us that the little kids report feeling more comfortable uh, than the high school kids do. And I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and it might just be uh, based off of perspective, kind of where, where the students are in their level of education. But um, the most striking thing about this data is we just want to see a little bit more students feeling comfortable at the high school level. Um, we have over roughly 40% of students not feeling that comfortable. So that's just something that um, we're going to look forward to a little bit more. Um, we asked kids about how comfortable they are with the different formats, Google Classroom, Zoom, Google Meet. Um, and we also had a category for other programs that we told the kids meant um, Class Dojo and Remind and different things like that. Um, pretty fairly consistent across the board, really. Um, roughly 70% of kids in each of the three grade bands are saying that they're, they're mm -hmm. good, it's easy or extremely easy. Um, and then about 10% are not feeling very comfortable, not easy at all, or slightly easy. Um, and those are kids that we can reach out and work, work with. Um, this was another one uh, that we thought was pretty interesting. Yeah, um, this is one we'd want to see a little bit more improvement on. But once again, it might be another um, case of just perspective of where students are in their level of education. But um, definitely in the high school level, we want to see definitely a lot more focus. And um, you'll see this in a few other of the questions asked is um, the communication interaction within like student bodies, the students in those classrooms. It seems to be kind of lacking, or at least the data would suggest that. So that's something we're going to pay a little bit more attention to and going to improve on. We asked how much of their school day do they spend learning online? And um, this, this is another case of just perspective. Um, high school students, we would like to see a little bit more um, time online. But um, as far as the elementary schools and middle schools, uh, they're kind of in the right area. So based on like, how much learning they're actually doing, this is like, this is good data. This is, shows us the right direction. Yeah, and it does show us that the little kids um, are saying that they spend a little bit less time in the, the almost the entire day category. And that's really a function of their schedules versus the, um, the middle school and high school kids and how they have longer class periods and how things are broken up a little bit. Um, then we asked about what happens after school. Um, yeah, and this is, this is another case of uh, level of education. One thing I found as a student is that the amount of homework and uh, stuff that's needed to be done after school has been less than it has been in years prior which is totally fine because students are getting a lot done in their class period. So um, this data doesn't raise any alarms. We do want to see some students who aren't um, doing any studying or doing any schoolwork after, after school, doing a little bit more, but um, this data is in the right direction as well. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then we asked students, what are the challenges that they face um, when they're trying to complete their remote learning assignments. And again, this is information that we can, um, you know, look at and talk to social workers about and reach out to kids that uh, might need some support in certain areas. So um, you can see here, and here we did raw numbers because we thought that made a little bit more sense. Um, I don't know where 45 kids are saying that they don't have a device, but it's kind of to the same point Mr. Sinella mentioned earlier. Uh, but we can reach out to those 45 kids and say, what's going on? Why not? And try to fix the situation. Um, 89 said no internet. Um, that seems high, but we'll reach out and talk to those kids as well. Um, and you can take a look at all the other categories here. The motivation one was huge. Mm -hmm. And the difficulty getting started. Yeah. Um, and so then we started to ask kids about um, their relationships and um, if they're able to access people. So 
you can see this question here is, you know, pretty pleasing to see that 94% uh, strongly agree or agree that they know how to get in touch with their teachers if they're having trouble. Um, and we think that's a function of the small group work that we do with students. Um, another piece that the Department of Education is encouraging that we reduce. Yeah, I would just say that that data is just a great sign, credit to the faculty, really just being an email away, a text away to just contacting students. Yeah. Uh, and then we asked the same question about guidance counselors and social workers. And um, this is where, like, it's, so it's slightly lower, 74% uh, here um, strongly agree or agree. And this is where, when we looked at the data by grade span, or even by grade level, we saw some expected discrepancies. Like I had mentioned, the freshmen had uh, lower rankings on this question than the juniors and seniors. And that's to be expected because the freshmen haven't been in the building. Um, they don't necessarily have those established relationships with social workers or guidance counselors. They're not people that they see every day in the Zoom classroom the way they do their classroom teachers. And that's why we saw a higher rate on the previous slide than we saw on this one, or why we think we did. I don't know if Ryan, you want to add anything to that? No, I have nothing to add for that one. How much do you like connecting with your teachers and classes? Seems yeah, like the kids Zoom like it. Or Zoom for this, which is a good sign once again. Yeah. Um, this is one I'll take. Um, as far as students collaborating with their peers in the remote um, setting, this might be the most uh, striking data point that we have. And as a student, in my experience, there has been a lot of um, collaboration between students. And that might that is basically, at least at the high school level, that's probably just a product of the online environment. It is very difficult to get students engaged with each other in these smaller breakup rooms from the Zoom calls. And um, this is something that we're we're going to look into a little bit more as to why it's not happening, whether this is solely based off of just a structure of classes or if teachers are choosing a different type of style to teach this year. But um, this is definitely striking and something we want to fix. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that um, it's one of the things that we've been working on at the secondary level is increasing the amount of peer collaboration and um, less teacher direct instruction. We see more of that in the small group work that organically happens at the elementary level uh, when they do stations in the classroom. Um, but this just accentuates that even in our remote learning environment, we need to do a little bit more work at the secondary level on that. This one, uh, kids, we were wondering if kids were having trouble submitting their homework assignments. It appears that most are not, a very small number are. And again, that's something that we can reach out on. Ryan, you want to take this one? Yeah, um, this is another data point as, as far as, once again, the high school level. And this is also a case of perspective where students might just be a little less, a little bit more disengaged with the type of education that they're getting. And um, but seeing that 38 percent of students either disagree or strong disagree that the content is engaging and interesting. Um, once again, I feel that ties back into the collaboration of the peers and possibly the style of the teaching. And um, given the current environment, this might be something we need to dig deeper in to see like, okay, well, how can we alter our style of teaching so we can make the content more interesting? We can engage with students a little bit better. So. And then uh, this, this slide, um, again, good results, not great results. Like clearly we want all of the kids to feel supported by their school. Um, and where we have 24% that are only saying somewhat and another 3% that say they do not feel supported. Um, that's some space where we know we need to focus attention. Mm -hmm. We asked them a little bit about their outside activities. This is part of our health and wellness to uh, check in with, with kids. And you, know, you could take a closer look at this when it's on the website. Um, and uh, another question that we asked to really assess where kids are and uh, emotionally and um, where kids need support. Um, we asked them if they have a system or not for support. Um, and the 28% who said no is troubling without a doubt. 
Um, and, and that's a place where our social workers will focus attention as well. Ryan, you want to say anything on that? Or? No, I have nothing to say on that one. All right, last question. So uh, once again, like th this, there is some good and bad in this data. It's good to see that a lot of our students are feeling happy, but um, as far as say optimistic, um, being hopeless, these are things that's kind of just a product of the environment. Once again, not having that face-to-face -face interaction, it's taking a toll on student morale and sometimes student spirit. And uh, this might be something that comes, that gets a little bit better as time goes on, but as far as given the current situation, the data is, isn't that bad. We're happy that some that a lot of students are happy and that they're safe and comfortable. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, and again, this gives us more data. We can look at um, how students responded to multiple questions and really narrow down which kids are um, in need of some significant support and prioritize uh, reaching out to work with those kids. So any questions or comments? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't see any questions or comments from any school committee members. Definitely some work to do, but we are yeah. collecting, yeah. I think we're asking the right questions that are gonna yeah. put us in the right direction mm -hmm. to help kids. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Mayor, I think I saw Mrs. Rizzo's hand go up. No, I, I just wanted to say it was kind of, I don't know, somewhat disappointed. Um, I don't know where we should have been at this point, um, but like, with all the circumstances, I can see some people, um, you know, we don't know what's going on in their home life too. So everything together is not making them as optimistic and maybe some answering some of the questions. Um, but I am glad for the most part, people are comfortable with the support they get in, in school. Mm -hmm. Just hopefully 2021 makes it a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Sorry. True. I I think it's uh, I think it's wonderful that they were willing to share that. Mm -hmm. They felt safe enough to share. True. Does the committee want to um, suspend the rules and and uh, go out of order and go into executive session and, with the expectation that we would come back? Or I mean, it's eight fifty one now. I uh, does Nick? I mean, is he available? I, still, I texted or? Nick. He's okay. He's gonna. Um, I told him it would probably be a couple more minutes. Uh, I think Ryan might have had a few more things that he wanted to share. Mm -hmm. Um, just to get the student uh, representative report done. And Perfect. then we can um, do that, Mr. Mayor, if that's okay. Perfect. Yeah, so I'll just go right ahead then. I only have three points on a slideshow, so there's not really any point of sharing it, but um, to start off the underclassmen elections, which is freshman, sophomore, and junior class, they are just about done. And we're going to have um, a new group of students that are kind of leading the change during this um, very dynamic year, so that's a step in the right direction. Um, on top of that, this is sim a similar concept as what was mentioned during the Whalen School presentation. The senior class is doing a senior to senior um, card um, organizer for um, where mm -hmm. seniors to senior students are mailing out cards, just kind of support to the senior citizens in the city. Um, this is just a community building event that the student council really was um, hopeful that they could do, and we are in the process of doing that. And um, lastly, the online PayPal, PayPal accounts for the senior class is in the works and we're expecting it to be done with within the coming week or two weeks or so. And that's just a really, that's a great step forward for just raising money for all the potential senior activities and um, 
gifts and just events that the senior students really need this year. So that's all I have. Nice. Great. Thanks, nice Ryan. Nice work, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Great Thank work. You. Any any members have any um, questions? I um, I Good hope start. we are notified when it's up and running so we can participate. Of course. Thank you, Ryan. Okay. All right, so if you, I don't know if you guys have to make a motion or something right now. I'm gonna send yep. a separate Zoom link um, because the webinar format others can follow even if we're not live. So I'm gonna send you a separate Zoom email link by Zoom meeting link by email. Well, we have to make okay. a motion to go into executive session. We need a motion to, to send right. the rules and uh, go into executive session. I'll make uh, the with motion. With the expectation that we will come back after that um, executive session ends. Yeah. Michael, I'll second it. Okay. Uh, roll call. Mrs. Bronson Rizzo. Yes. Mr. D'Ambrosio. Yes. Mr. Ferranti. Yes. Mrs. Gravelisi. Yes. Mr. Sanella? Yes. Ms. Ty? Yes. Mayor Arrigo? Yes. Okay. We will uh, stand in, in, in recess um, from our public meeting until we um, uh, come back from our executive.